following political debate between Senator John F. Kennedy and Senator Hubert H. Humphrey is being presented by WCHS-TV, the Charleston Gazette, and the participating stations as a public service. Now, here is the moderator for the debate, WCHS-TV News Director, Bill Ames. Good evening. The West Virginia primary election campaign has already been characterized by the unique and the unusual, and that tradition is being followed in spectacular and unusual fashion tonight with a face-to-face -face debate between Senator Hubert H. Humphrey of Minnesota and Senator John F. Kennedy of Massachusetts. For weeks, the attention of the nation has been focused on the voters of West Virginia and on the efforts of these two men to enlist their support in the presidential preference balloting next Tuesday. In that voting, only registered Democrats can cast their ballots for these presidential candidates and the outcome of the voting is not binding on the Democratic delegates to the July convention in Los Angeles. Still, it is generally agreed that the results of next week's election in West Virginia will be important to the presidential ambitions of the winner and of the loser. With a desire to crystallize for the voter the issues in the West Virginia presidential race, the Charleston Gazette, WCHS-TV, and participating <coughs> stations in and out of the state have brought Senators Humphrey and Kennedy together for this encounter. Formal debate will begin the program. A question and answer period will follow the debate. The questions which will be asked have been sent in to the Charleston Gazette by its readers. The questions will be put to the Senators by the two men on either side of me, Ned Chilton, assistant to the publisher of the Charleston Gazette, and by Dale Schussler of the news department of WTRF-TV in Wheeling. Gentlemen, in the debate, you will each have an opportunity for an opening five-minute statement. Then you will have five minutes for rebuttal. In the toss of a coin before broadcast time tonight, you won Senator Kennedy and then chose to go second in debate. The order to be followed in opening statements and rebuttal, therefore, is the opening, Senator Humphrey, then an opening by Senator Kennedy, rebuttal by Senator Humphrey, and rebuttal by Senator Kennedy. Now, the sound of this buzzer will indicate that your time is at an end, and I ask your cooperation in observing the limitations placed upon you. And so, Senator Humphrey, may we begin with your opening five-minute statement. Thank you, Mr. Ames and fellow Americans. Now, every political campaign should make a truly constructive contribution to American democracy. We should learn and become informed. And I have learned that here in West Virginia, that you want a government which never rests in this all-important and vital effort to build a secure and an enduring peace. I have learned that you want a government that cares and acts for the people and understands the needs of the people. And you want a government that isn't blinded by budget-balancing slogans, but rather is deeply dedicated to a balanced nation in which the pockets of depression and unemployment and poverty are erased. Now, the problems of this wonderful and beautiful West Virginia are much the same as those of other states and indeed of the world itself. And mind you, these problems are growing and spreading like a cancer throughout our very land. There's one thing to me that's crystal clear. America needs a democratic victory. And I pledge my wholehearted and active support to any forward-looking Democrat who may win the nomination and I mean that to my friend John Kennedy as well. Richard Nixon must not be the next president of the United States. We've had too many years of caretaker government that ignores problems and avoids opportunities. Too many years of shameful neglect of America's needs at home and waste and loss of America's prestige abroad. We have, in fact, friends, been the victims of a no-go go slow, not now, veto administration. Popularity has been substituted for leadership and mediocrity for principle. Slogans have been offered in place of programs and public relations instead of genuine public service. America, yes, West Virginia, deserves a much better deal. Now we have one basic problem. A conservative Republican government in Washington that is content with standing still in a changing America and a very rapidly changing world. And talk, 
talk has been substituted for deeds. Little or nothing has been done about distressed industries such as coal or depressed areas or the problems of technological unemployment and automation. Or indeed, little or nothing about the growing demands and needs of education or the care of our elderly. The Republican administration has put on the brakes on the American economy when we should be moving ahead with giant strides. It has complained about growing surpluses of food and fiber, while in many parts of America, yes, in West Virginia, children suffer from inadequate diet. It shouts of inflation as it adds to the cost of living by hiking up the interest rates and tightening up the credit. And we pay a terrible price for this indifference. Now, these problems in West Virginia and the other states of our union are in fact, however, not the worst that America faces. Time has caught up with America. For the past seven years, the Soviet Union has been eating up the lead that America inherited, indeed, from past administrations. And it's going to be a pitiful inheritance that our next president will receive from this administration when he sits across the table from the Soviet dictator, Mr. Khrushchev. Now, the next 10 years may well decide whether the United States is to be a first-class power or become a second-class nation. More than a year ago, I sat across the table from Mr. Khrushchev for better than eight hours. I saw him as he is, tough and able, a communist, a Bolshevik, determined to surpass the United States. And he is determined that communism will rule the world. And I am determined that it will not. Now, the next president must arouse this nation to heroic deeds. He must courageously search for a lasting peace with justice and freedom. And he must understand the complexities of disarmament negotiations, the workings of diplomacy, the United Nations. He must develop a force for peace, using our food and our fiber surplus to feed the hungry, our medical knowledge to heal the sick, and our education to teach the illiterate. I've tried to prepare myself for this. Now, the West Virginia primary is more than a popularity contest. There are differences between the candidates. But the basic difference has been very accurately assessed by the journalists of one of temperament and one of attitude and one of approach. Now, how you should vote, I think, depends on your sober assessment of the need of West Virginia. Satisfied with things as they are, then you'll vote for Mr. Nixon. If you think that only a little change, a moderate change is needed for my friend. If you believe that a vigorous, hard-hitting, constructive action is required, you know my record, and I hope you'll find me your man. Thank you. And now, Senator Kennedy, it's your turn for five minutes of an opening statement. Ladies and gentlemen, I run for the presidency after 18 years in the service of the United States, four years in the Navy, and 14 years in the Congress, because I believe the presidency is the key office. It is the center of action. And because I believe strongly in my country and in its destiny, and because I believe the power and influence of the next president and his vitality and force are going to be the great factor in meeting the responsibilities that we're going to face. So I run for the presidency. And because the presidency is the people's office, as no other office is, it is my judgment that any candidate for the presidency should be willing to submit their name, their fortunes, their record, and their views to people in primaries all over the United States. West Virginia has such a primary, and that is the reason that I am here. I did not have to come. I came of my own free will. There are no delegates involved. A setback here, a defeat, would be a major one. But nevertheless, I came. And I must say, I am extremely glad I came. I think this is the best experience and the best education that an American political leader can have, whether he serves in the presidency or serves in the Senate. Many of you who may be watching television in other parts of the country have been seeing a good deal of West Virginia through your TV. And I wonder whether you realize what a varied state it is and how unusual is its past and how bright is its promise. If there is one quality which I think this state can be justly proud of, it is the quality of courage. More men from West Virginia lost their lives in the Korean War than from any state in the Union of its size. 
More West Virginians served in World War II than for any state of its size. I was in Hinton this morning, which is the home of the navigator who flew with my brother before he was killed. This is a state which has sent men to die in every section of the world. And also here in the state of West Virginia, you have to have courage to work in the basic industry of this state, coal mining. Eight West Virginians die in the coal mines of this state every month. These people are tough and hard. They've lived in the mountains. They're probably more descendants of American Revolutionary soldiers here in West Virginia than in any state of the country. George Washington said many years ago, let me plant a banner in those mountains and I will set men free. This is a state that deserves an opportunity. It deserves recognition from our federal government. Last night I was in McDowell County. That county produces more coal than any county in the world. There are more people on relief in that county than in any county in the country. Now why should there be 250,000 people living on a subsistence and below subsistence distribution from the federal government who only want to work, 100,000 able-bodied men who want a job and can't find it, who have spent their lives in the coal mines, who have spent their lives underground working in 35 or 40 inches and who want to get a job again, who want to work. That is the problem of West Virginia. This state can really do a good deal. I don't think I've seen a more vigorous industrial complex than I've seen along the Ohio Valley and the Canoe River or better farms. The people of this state only need a chance and I think that they're going to get it. I think this election is probably as important to West Virginia as any state in the country. And I hope the people of this country regard carefully what's happened here because the problem that West Virginia is facing is the problem that all America is going to face. That is the problem of what happens to men when machines take their place. We produce more coal than we did 20 years ago in West Virginia, but there are thousands of men who mined in 1940 who can't find a job. What is happening in the coal industry in the last 10 years in West Virginia is going to spread all over the country. When a machine takes the job of 10 men, where do those 10 men go? What happens to their families? They live in unemployment compensation and that runs out. They live on a subsistence diet distributed by the federal government which is beyond the living standard for any American. And then they wait for a chance and a job. I must say I am delighted I came here to West Virginia. I think everyone who seeks the office of the presidency should be willing to come. The lesson is hard, but it's important for all Americans. Thank you very much, Senator Kennedy. You have uh, been shy 10 seconds of your five minutes. We move on now to the rebuttal portion of the formal debate. Senator Humphrey, in, the, with, in accordance with the, uh, pre the order established by the flipping of the coin, it is your turn now to rebut. You will have five minutes for this as well. And you may begin, sir. Thank you, Mr. Ames. <coughs> it would be, of course, uh, very undesirable and foolish to attempt to rebut a fine and splendid and pleasant statement as to the, the wonderful assets and the great qualities of the state of West Virginia and its people, the state that has this marvelous history of freedom and its great contribution to our American system. But I do think there are points that well ought to be emphasized that once having made the generalized statements, while it is true that automation and technological improvements have taken jobs, it is equally true that a government that is worthy of the respect of the American people will move into action with private industry and with labor and with the local communities to find new jobs, to retrain workers, to provide for new industries and to diversify the economy. It is equally true that a government has a responsibility, not the total responsibility, but a responsibility to the total economy of the nation. And when you break that down, you make it into the respective jurisdictions such as our states. Now, West Virginia's problems, as I indicated in my opening statement, are characteristic of this country. In fact, I might say that I wish that the television camera that, is, that has become so much a part of the American scene would not only focus upon uh, certain areas of West Virginia uh, where there is unemployment and distress, but that it would find its way into parts of New York City and Philadelphia 
and Baltimore and Boston and yes, Minneapolis and Chicago to look into those slums where people live in, uh, in metropolitan areas in conditions that are incredible. And yet we have a government that says we have prosperity. I must say without arguing with my associate from Massachusetts that we have been taught in recent days by our current government not to care. And I consider this to be immoral. It is absolutely necessary for us to care for one another. The strength of the American economy is best judged by the weakness of any section or any person or any part. And wherever there is an area of unemployment or distress or suffering, wherever there is a slum, wherever there are conditions that degrade humankind, it weakens America. And it surely weakens our moral posture in the world. And it takes a terrible toll in terms of the economics of our country. You see, I was trying to emphasize in my opening statement that America needs to be strong. We're facing the toughest competition of our lives, tougher than anyone ever dreamed. And the Soviet Union, and Mr. Khrushchev, as he symbolizes it, is determined to surpass us. And he's fighting us, competing with us on every area, not merely military. He's competing with us economics and economics and education, science and technology and culture. And we have to be prepared to meet that competition and to surpass it, to expand the areas of freedom. Now, you can't do that if you ignore problems at home. For example, if we're going to have a foreign policy which is willing to loan economic assistance to every nation in the world under the International Development Loan Fund, which I have supported, it seems to me we must have a domestic policy which will make possible loans to local, lo to local communities, to local industries, to Americans for the improvement of economic conditions in our own country. In other words, our ability to maintain our strength abroad will be dependent in no small part upon our capacity to have full production and employment at home with social justice. Now, I have some programs that I've mentioned. I don't think the generalities are anywhere uh, accurate or adequate. I think I know what it means to be in trouble, to be poor, to be without a job. I learned something about that in the depression of South Dakota. I've seen it in the iron mines of Minnesota. I didn't have to go to the coal mines of West Virginia for first-hand knowledge. I've seen it. I've tasted it. I don't like it. And therefore, I propose that we have area redevelopment, that we find new uses for coal and find new outlets for this great source of power, that we build generating plants at the mouth of the mine, for example, that we distribute electricity throughout this whole eastern seaboard which is a great power center of America, the great industrial center, that we develop the great recreational facilities of West Virginia, that we make it the people's playground, that we give our young people a chance to work in the forests and out in the public lands and the parks in a youth conservation corps program, that we spend time and money upon conservation. All of this is an asset. All of this is an investment in the future. Those are my views for the future of this state. And now, Senator Kennedy, it is your turn to rebut the statements made by Senator Humphrey. Our thanks to you, Senator Humphrey. Senator Kennedy, your time begins right now. During my uh, speech, uh, I think that uh, considering the problems of West Virginia, I think the people of West Virginia are concerned about what can be done. And I think the people of the United States are concerned. This is a problem which goes beyond West Virginia. In Massachusetts, we lost our textile industry, and we had, uh, through four, five, or six years in the great mill towns, an extremely difficult time. Pennsylvania, southern Illinois, Kentucky, parts of Indiana, parts of Ohio, have all been hard hit by technological change. The question is, what shall we do about them? What shall we do about West Virginia? I said that there were 250,000 people getting surplus food from the government. I received a letter the other day April 23rd, from A.F. Johnston, Fox 17, Montcalm, West Virginia. Here's what he gets every month from the government. I'm a man with TB, and I happen to get surplus food. I have seven children. This is what I receive. Five bags of flour, four cans of eggs, three five-pound bags of meal, eight pounds of shortening, four pounds of rice, which we can't use if we don't get it clean, and four powdered milk. We do not get any butter, cheese, or beans, as Mr. Benson stated. I will challenge anybody on the surplus food situation on what we get, what we don't get. 
These are the powdered eggs. For a family of four, you get three of these per month. It uh, says for distribution to needy persons. There's 250,000 people in West Virginia getting this kind of assistance every month. It's in an inadequate diet. There are a good many children who get their only good meal when they go to school and who bring some of it home to share with their brothers and sisters. This is a national problem, not a problem just for West Virginia. And it certainly is a problem which needs the devoted effort of the federal government, the president, the administration, and the Congress. There are, I think, some things we ought to do immediately. First place, we ought to send a better diet to those who are dependent upon the government. This is not a satisfactory diet for America. We should certainly add decent food. We send many of them overseas. We sell them for local currency overseas. We should send them here. Secondly, we should add to the unemployment compensation benefit. After 24 weeks, a man goes out. He waits on relief. He waits for surplus food. I think we should give him the 39 weeks that the administration has recommended, make it a part of federal minimum standards, because no state has adopted the 39 weeks. Thirdly, I think we ought to do, as Senator Humphrey said, pass the Area Redevelopment Bill, which makes it possible for small businesses to come in, which makes it possible for communities to clean the water, to attract industry makes it possible to retrain workers in a new world, vocational retraining. All these things can be done if the force of the federal government is put behind them. Then I think we can do a good deal more about West Virginia and other states in sending defense contracts to them. You know that West Virginia, which had the most serious unemployment in the United States last year, was the lowest in the number of defense contracts it received. West Virginia received $20 million in defense contracts from the Pentagon, which is spending over $40 billion. My own state of Massachusetts received a billion, 400 million. Virginia, which borders right next to you, received 1 billion, 28 million. I think that the Defense Department should set aside of every contract a percentage which would go into those areas where there was a high level of unemployment. Then I think we ought to begin to consider long range recovery of how we can attract new industries into this area how we can provide new uses for coal. The administration vetoed the coal research bill. I think the administration should approve it. I think that the federal government must recognize that as machines come in and men are thrown out of work, it presents a problem not just to the community, but also to the country. I think in every industry in the United States in the next 10 years, there should be councils between labor and management with government representatives so that as machinery comes in which throws people out of work, we can find new jobs for them, new training, that the machines come in in a way that will help people rather than just provide unemployment. This is the lesson of West Virginia. This is why West Virginia should be a matter of greatest concern to us all, because what has happened to these people can happen in every state of the country. West Virginia needs help, and I think it ought to be on the desk of the next president of the United States. Thank you, Senator Kennedy. Now, gentlemen, we have concluded the formal portion of the program, the formal debate with opening statements and then rebuttals, and we come to the portion which will be devoted to questions and answers. Now, I'll remind you again that the questions have all been sent to the Charleston Gazette by its readers, and that they've been screened by the editorial board of the Gazette to avoid repetition and to make a representative selection of the hundreds that were received. Now the ground rules regarding the answering of questions are as follows. The questions will be asked of you alternately and you have two minutes in which to give your answer. Now, at the end of the two minutes, the familiar buzzer, the buzzer with which you've now become familiar, will sound as it has before and you will stop. And I must ask your cooperation in observing that. The candidate to whom the question was not directed, some have been directed to you both, but the candidate to whom the question was not directed will have the option of comment if he so desires. And the time limit on comment will also be two minutes. Now, may we have the first question first from Ned Chilton of the Charleston <coughs> Gazette. The first question is addressed to both of you gentlemen, and I'll ask Mr. Humphrey first. Should Red China be permitted to join the United Nations that is sent in by Charles W. Simpson of Syracuse, New York? Well, Mr. Simpson and Mr. Chilton, 
I would not, as a delegate to the United Nations representing this country, nor would I, if responsible for the nation's foreign policy, recommend, at least at this time, the admission of Red China to the United Nations. She has demonstrated a kind of arrogance, and a kind of intransigence, which I believe is anything but uh, worthy of the respect and of the consideration of our country. May I further add that the charter of the United Nations requires that the nations that are members thereof should be peace-loving nations. Now, I know there are some members of the UN that surely don't qualify too well for that particular description. But I would add they came in at the time of the United Nations inception. And now we have an opportunity to weigh the admission of new, mem new members very carefully. Now, I qualify my statement by saying that you don't take a position in terms of the uh, indefinite future. You take it in terms of the present circumstances. Thank you, Senator Humphrey. Senator Kennedy, do you... Uh, well, this question was directed, was it? To not? both, yes, to both. Yes, I would agree with Senator Humphrey, unless the Chinese Communists demonstrated a change in their foreign policy. And we've seen a very uh, belligerent phase of their foreign policy in their relations with India during the past year, unless they're willing to demonstrate that they desire to live with peace with the neighbors to the south of them, work out a solution to the problems facing us, including the problems of disarmament, then I would not recognize them. But if they indicated that they would, then I would begin negotiations to see if it's possible to establish more intimate relations. After all, we desire peace and harmony. They are one quarter of the world. But I do think that they have to meet certain standards before recognition should be coming. Thank you, sir. The next question comes to us uh, with Dale Schistler of WTRF-TV as the question. It's addressed to you, Senator Kennedy. It comes from a reader in White Sulphur Springs, Charlotte Cabot. She asks, in your opinion, are the Soviets acting in good faith when they press the case for disarmament? Well, not uh, for disarmament. Uh, when they say that they want complete disarmament, then quite obviously that's impossible unless they would agree to the kind of inspection which they have been unwilling to disagree to, to agree to. In addition, I don't think that they have shown particular vigor in good faith because they failed to agree to the efforts we've made to provide for the disarmament of outer space, which would be possible, as no country today dominates outer space. I am hopeful, however, that it will be possible to reach out to reach some agreement with the Soviet Union on nuclear testing. I think this is an area where it may be to our mutual advantage where it may be to the self-interest of the Soviet Union and the United States to agree to the cessation of tests, to agree to a realistic and workable inspection system. And if that should be, then I'm hopeful we can proceed on that basis. But on the general thesis which Mr. Khrushchev advanced many months ago of immediate disarmament, I don't think they're working in good faith. And I comment? Humphrey? would agree that there is uh, considerable evidence of the lack of what one might call good faith. But I do have some hopes about the summit conference, particularly if the summit conference, the first summit conference, is limited to the phase of disarmament discussions. Now at that conference, I think the most that we could expect is to be able to lay down or to get an agreement upon the ground rules for the present 10 nation uh, disarmament conference that's underway in Geneva. If we could get the ground rules clearly understood, in other words, how, what they were to do in the Ten Nation Conference, this would be a forward step, particularly if there was a firm agreement. Secondly, there is one basic problem in the field of the nuclear test suspension with the adequate inspection and control. And that problem is the number of on-site inspections where the mobile teams, the international inspection teams, can move into an area where there seems to be a suspicious event. Now, if we could come to an agreement upon the number of on-site inspections, then I think we would be making some forward progress in the field of disarmament. And this is a prospect that lends some hope. I think the Soviet U Union needs peace for at least the next seven to eight years if it's to uh, fulfill its seven-year plan. Senator Humphrey, the next question <coughs> is addressed to you from J.A. Asbury of Glasgow, West Virginia. What stand do you take on the proposal to raise federal income tax exemptions from $600 to $800? I took a stand early on that, and this is one of the differences between my colleague from Massachusetts and myself, a difference of degree, I might add. I voted uh, for the amendment offered by the senator from Texas, Mr. Yarborough, to increase the exemption from six to eight hundred dollars 
I also voted for the George Amendment of the late Senator Walter George to, uh, to increase the exemption from six to seven hundred dollars as a, it was a, a, a similar measure but of less degree. Now I felt this was important at the time that it was up because there was considerable recession in the country, growing unemployment, and genuine economic distress. I feel that the use of the tax laws to be able to stimulate purchasing power and to broaden the base of the, uh, of the, uh, of the, consu of the consumers or the consumption ability of the, of the people is very important. Now, I would have made up that loss of revenue, and it was a loss of revenue. I would have made it up by having withholding taxes upon dividends and interest, upon uh, closing tax loopholes, such as reducing the amount of depletion allowance on gas and oil. I voted to, de uh, to decrease it from 27.5% to 15%. And those two items alone, the reduction and the depletion allowance, which I re submit is fair, the present law is special privilege. Closing the tax loophole on interest and dividends would more than have compensated for the loss of revenue, and the individual family, head of family, would have had more money with which to make his purchases, to educate his family, to take care of the medical needs of his family, and to be a better customer. I think it was a sensible vote. Thank you, sir. Next question, Dale. Oh, excuse me, Senator Kennedy, do you have any... Well, as I understood, the question was, am I in favor of it today? Is that the question? What stand do you take on the proposal to raise federal income tax exemptions from 600 to 800? Well, I'm not... Uh, I think it would be a mistake and misleading for me to suggest that I'm going to favor a good many of the programs that I've talked about earlier. Also, a stronger national defense, federal aid to education, assistance to this state and other states, and at the same time say that I'm going to reduce income taxes this year. I don't think that's possible. I think it's, uh, I think that we, in the final analysis, the President of the United States has to make a determination of what is in the long-range interest of this country. And I don't think, therefore, that at the present time, until the economy is moved up, I think it's going to be possible to reduce income taxes. Now, secondly, I am hardly in favor of closing the loopholes. I hope that can be done. We've been defeated on many occasions since I've been in the Senate. In the eight years I've been in the Senate, the vote has come up on many times, and it's been defeated on every occasion. I hope we can do something about the oil depletion allowance. I think 27% is too much. So I do agree that we ought to try to close the loopholes. There are many things that can be done, but until we do it, until we're able to bring in enough revenue to make up for the loss, I cannot advocate at this time that reduction in taxes. The next question is addressed to both of you gentlemen. Uh, the name has been withheld. The reader lives in Bluefield, West Virginia. Senator Humphrey, former President Harry Truman, has said that if he were a merchant faced with a lunch counter sit-down demonstration uh, by Negroes, he would chase them out of his store. Uh, what would you do, is the question asked. Well, I surely wouldn't. As a matter of fact, I feel that the young men and women who have engaged in these respective demonstrations have been orderly, They've been standing up for their rights as they see them as American citizens, and they've been applying what I would call a higher moral law. Now, there may be instances and localities where the local ordinances uh, give protection to existing inequities and injustices. If that's the case, those ordinances should be changed. And in the meantime, I would suggest to those who are the operators of private business establishments that they have some consideration for not only the constitutional rights of people, under the 14th Amendment, because no state is supposed to pass any law which falls unequally upon its citizens. And I would suggest also they might practice some good business sense by treating customers with uh, equity and with equality. And I'd like to add, however, if I may go back to another question on this, is that within the rules? Um, on the tax question? I believe, sir, that you have uh, one minute left. Yes, I'd just like to point back. this out, that the Tax Act of 1954, passed by the 83rd Republican Congress, is not divine script, it's not sac sacrosanct, sacrosanct, it is man-made law, it is filled with inequities and injustices, I refuse to accept it without protesting against it, I did not vote for it, I thought that it was injustice consummate, and I feel that the, that the tax loopholes will not be closed, until there is a firm determination on the part of more of us in the Congress, like myself, to demand some equity in the tax laws. And that's why I would have supported, and do support, an increase in the deduction for the average family, because I think it will lend itself to the health of the economy and compel this government to do justice in the tax laws, rather than to continue to spread the benefits to a handful of people who do not need them. 
Senators, before we proceed, you have an answer to the question that was raised, Senator Kennedy, but let me point out this fact that uh, Senator Humphrey raised the point, and it was a legitimate one. If you finish your answer to a specific question, and you have some comment you would like to throw in on some subject raised before, you will have the option to use up the two-minute time in that kind of reply, should you so desire. This would be true of both. The question that was asked of you, sir, Senator Kennedy, was uh, if you were faced with a lunch counter sit-in demonstration by Negroes, would you chase such demonstrators from your store? No, I wouldn't. Providing the demonstrations are peaceful and respect the rights of others, it is in the great American tradition of peaceful protest, which goes back to the beginning of this country. I certainly wouldn't chase them out. Senator Kennedy, the <coughs> next question is <coughs> asked of you, sent in from Bill Buchanan of Beckley. In view of the recent troubles in Cuba, do you feel we should continue to perch cu purchase Cuban sugar at prices above the world trade prices? Well, I think the best thing to do about Cuba at the present time is to put the quota and its maintenance in the hands of the president. The administration has recommended that as a member of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, which both Senator Humphrey and I are. I would suggest that that is the most appropriate cost. And we can carry it on on a month-by-month -month basis. And we can make a determination as events change. They're constantly changing. And uh, we don't know what's going to be the situation six months from now. For the present, therefore, I would continue it as it is. To merely cut it on the basis that you suggest would be an annoying act would have no serious effect on Mr. Castro. In fact, it would make him be able to say to the world that we were carrying on economic discrimination against him. There was no doubt he would take reprisals against Americans who were there. Therefore, for the present, I must say, in the case of Cuba, I agree with the administration policy. This is one of the few times, may I say, where I have agreed that the administration's reluctance to act has had a positive and affirmative uh, uh, position or policy. I thoroughly agree with the comments of my uh, colleague from Massachusetts, that this kind of, uh, of patience which we've exercised uh, is, uh, is creditable, desirable, and uh, I too have the feeling that the president, uh, whoever the president may be, must have within his power the, uh, the opportunity to take uh, timely action as the national security requires. I believe that that flexibility would be a highly desirable development, and I surely support it. Senator Humphrey, would you agree with this statement from a reader in Lake West Virginia TV, Saunders by name? Uh, how do you feel in regard to foreign aid? Doesn't it make more enemies than it does friends? Well, it can, but I don't think it does. In the main, the foreign aid program has been a constructive force in American life and American foreign policy. There has been a tendency, however, of late to emphasize primarily the monetary aspects of foreign aid rather than the manner in which it is, uh, it is utilized and the manner in which it, it is effectuated. Take, for example, some time ago, I wrote to the State Department about our foreign aid program in Korea. I had information which led me to believe that it was being poorly administered. In fact, there were some elements of corruption. The administration didn't seem to feel that that was the case. I made a speech in the Senate. In fact, I made five speeches over two years in the Senate on Korea, pointing out what was happening over there, which finally developed, as you know, into riots with the government having to be changed. And uh, we now discover that the foreign aid program has been poorly managed and has cost the American taxpayers a substantial amount through mismanagement and corruption. But in the main, I must say that foreign aid is required. I don't think that we ought to uh, take it that we ought to do away with it. What we need are administrators of foreign aid, continuity of administration, who follow through to see that this foreign aid does some direct good for the people for which it is intended. Senator Kennedy? I think that it would be the advantage of both the United States and the countries involved if more and more foreign aid could be put in the form of loans, if we could strengthen the development loan fund, make it possible for them to pay back not put so much emphasis on the disposition of surplus military equipment, which they're not able to sustain. We gave Laos, I think, something like $300 million, of it, and yet they weren't able to defend themselves against a 5,000 guerrilla invasion. So I would say I would strengthen the development loan fund, put it on the basis of loan. Then when people ask for it, they will have projects which are worthwhile, and it will be done on a more business-like basis. It does serve a useful function because so much of the world is in a going through a period of transition, Latin America and Africa and Asia. We want them to maintain their freedom. You've seen what's happened to the balance of power in the world when China went communist. 
We want to make sure that these other countries have a chance to develop under a free system. Our security is protected when they do so. Therefore, I think the best way, in a measured, careful way, strengthen the loan provisions, put the major emphasis into those, and also help get the countries of Western Europe, whom we assisted 10 years ago, to play their proportionate role in assisting these countries. This question is asked of both. I'll <coughs> query Mr. Humphrey first, Senator Humphrey first. Vice President Nixon, by inference, has said this country has nothing to fear until such time as an individual with no religion, an atheist or an agnostic, is a candidate for president. Would you care to comment on this? Well, I believe it is quite well understood, or at least it should be, that the Constitution of the United States makes no religious requirement for any candidate for office. And my comment is that a good deal of this discussion on a subject that is as sensitive and as volatile and as personal and intimate as one's religious convictions could be well relieved if there was a little less talk about it and a little more understanding about the personal matter of one's religious faith and convictions. I have said, and I shall repeat it, that the most important thing for a voter to understand about religion and politics is the moral laws, the ethical standards, or the moral standards of the individual candidates and the party that he may represent. In other words, we ought to have some religion, some faith in our heart, and by that I mean some love of fellow man, a recognition of our humility before divine providence, and the need of prayerful guidance and advice. Senator Kennedy? Well, of course, as uh, Senator Humphrey says, the Constitution is quite explicit. It says there shall be no religious test for office in Article 6, and then, of course, the First Amendment says Congress shall make no laws. So therefore, of course, uh, this country was founded on the basis of religious freedom, and that means that we all believe as we want to believe. And I don't think that the Vice President, and I'm sure he doesn't intend to, or anyone else, how could we decide whether somebody is irreligious or not religious? It's far better that we let them carry on their own uh, life, believe as they choose to do so, providing they have given adequate demonstration. They believe in the constitutional system, that they believe in the First Amendment, that they believe in the rights of others to worship as they want, that their decisions are made based on their own experience and their own best judgment. These are the great uh, factors which I think uh, motivate men as different as Jefferson and Lincoln, men who had entirely opposite in some ways, or some ways the same religious beliefs. This country, uh, this is perhaps the most important ingredient in the development of American character. From the beginning of this country, which was founded on the principle of religious freedom. Therefore, I'm uh, devoted, and I know Senator Humphrey is, to the maintenance of this tradition. And I'm confident that they are, too, in West Virginia. I, that's my experience, and I uh, continue to believe that. Uh, because I think it's such an important quality in the American character and the American experience. If this were lost, if we started to apply religious tests of one kind to another, then really something important in American life would go out. So I must say that I believe that people should be free, that's the important thing, to believe as they wish, providing they are loyal Americans and devoted to constitutional principles. Senator Humphrey, uh, Jerry Carney of Dunbar directs this question to you. Are you in favor of a national fair trade law? I have been. I feel that fair <laughs> trade laws uh, have a, uh, a place in the American economy. The biggest problem has been in the area of enforcement. I believe that there ought to be rules of conduct in the economic marketplace, just as there are rules of conduct in banking, in railroading, in utilities. I happen to believe that lost leaders lend themselves to the warfare, uh, to jungle warfare in the economic marketplace, threaten the very existence of private enterprise, particularly individually owned enterprise or partnerships. I have seen uh, through uh, experience, not through theory, the impact of the powerful large uh, interests upon uh, the independent retailer, and he is in need, particularly in those areas where there are nationally advertised brands, of some kind of uh, price protection, lest these uh, nationally advertised items be used as come-ons
to draw people into a business establishment and ultimately to destroy the independent merchant who is in fact as important to the American social and economic structure as the family farmer or indeed as the school teacher or the independent school district. These are the, these are the ways that we develop an America that has a degree of independence and a degree, uh, I would say, of social justice and fair play, which is so important a part of our national makeup. Senator Kennedy, do you wish to reply to that question? Well, I think we want to be careful in protecting smaller businessmen, and I must say I think they need protection, because I think in this administration, particularly <coughs> credit policies and all the rest, have worked to their disadvantage. We make sure that it doesn't uh, provide that uh, the consumers are going to have to pay a uh, unnecessarily high cost. I remember Senator Neely in the state making a speech on the Senate floor in which he said a fair trade bill would cost his people millions and millions of dollars. So that I think we want to be extremely careful before we push a national fair trade law that we are providing protection where it is needed and not merely uh, permitting a, a higher cost for a good many people. Gentlemen, Mrs. Elsie Osborne of Clendenin asks, why do Senator Kennedy, this is a question directed at both of you, why do Senator Kennedy and Senator Humphrey blame all the ills of West Virginia on the Eisenhower administration when we have a Democratic Congress of which both are members and which has done nothing yet toward helping us? Who well, are you going to let answer that one first? <laughs> Choose up, <son. laughs> Since I've been getting all the hot ones first, I'll take this one. <laughs> Go ahead, John, if you wish. Oh, no. Well, I was just going to say, and I'll let Senator Humphrey answer half of this question. I uh, remember that uh, taking the lead in Defense Manpower Policy Number 4 in 1953 to steer defense contracts into distressed areas, of which my state of Massachusetts had a good many. This administration committed themselves to maintaining it by executive order, and it was never done. Senator Nolan led the fight against our effort. I was the floor manager in the first area redevelopment bill, which was intended, and both of us have mentioned this, to assist areas like West Virginia, which had high unemployment. The president vetoed that bill. I'm going to let Senator Humphrey give a couple of other examples. Well, one other good example is the coal research bill, which was passed with the support, of course, of the members of the West Virginia delegation. And by the way, uh, the coal research bill had a very modest uh, appropriation to it that would have been of help to the coal industry in this state and indeed the entire economy. The president vetoed that. I might add, however, that we have 19 such research programs going in foreign countries, which the taxpayers of America pay for, but not one dime is to go into West Virginia. Furthermore, the administration has taken a very dim view upon such programs as the food stamp plan, which we passed that would have been of help right here in the state of West Virginia. Now, I'm the author of the food stamp plan. We attached it to the so-called surplus food disposal program last year. It would have provided for a balanced diet for the needy people in this state. There is over 400 millions of dollars of monies not paid in by taxpayers, but collected by tariffs on food imports into this country that are available. Those dollars are available to purchase poultry, meat, milk, butter, cheese, oleomargarine, soybean oil, whatever would be necessary for a balanced diet, including fr fruits and vegetables. The administration has vetoed 147 times acts of Congress, and we have not had the two-thirds to override the vetoes. I'm fully familiar with the area redevelopment bill, having been with Senator Kennedy a co-sponsor of it, and by the way, we've passed it again in the Senate, and I'm hoping that tonight the House of Representatives will have passed it for the second time so that the President will have it on his desk once more. I think, if I may say, that this indicates the importance of the presidency. Regardless of what action is taken by the members of Congress from this state or any other state, the presidency is the key office. The president can veto programs, as this administration has done, housing, water pollution, unemployment compensation, can oppose minimum wage, and you can't get action. All the president needs is one-third plus one in either the House or the Senate to stop any bill from passing. And in addition, the power of the president to suggest action to the Congress this is the key office. Make no mistake about it. The Congress is an equal and coordinate branch, but the power and influence of the prestige is of the presidency, that makes it the key office. And that's why I think it's important for West Virginia and the United States to have a change in administration. You know, I might add, uh, gentlemen, uh, that I remember the days of 1936 when Franklin Delano Roosevelt visited my home state of South Dakota at that time in the drought period. He came to see the conditions. I wish the President of the United States would come to see some of the conditions that we've seen in the state and other states. 
I can't help but feel that any man who occupied that high office with the tremendous power of the presidency would advocate programs of action and insist upon prompt action. But instead of that, I read the other day where the president thought that there was a liberal allowance for foodstuffs in this state. Senator, Ken or Senator Ken Senators Kennedy and Humphrey, you, you put a mathematical burden on me there that I hope I fulfilled, but jointly you each had two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Chilton, I think you have the next question. Uh, Senator Kennedy, this one is <coughs> submitted to you by J. Hugh Cummings of Parkersburg. Are you willing to take a definite stand on Senator McCarthy? Yes, I am. I said that I support the censure. Yes. You on many occasions I've stated that. I supported the censure in the Senate at the time of the vote and uh, spoke, in this, and spoke in favor of it. Senator Humphrey, uh, Betty Twaddle, I believe is the name, from St. Albans, West Virginia, asks this question of you. Do you honestly feel that if you should win the West Virginia primary, you would have a chance of getting the Democratic nomination? I surely do, and I suppose it's at this point where I disagree most sharply with my friend from Massachusetts. No Democrat has this nomination tied up. There are a number of Democrats that are potential Democratic nominees. And the West Virginia primary is a significant primary. It isn't the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end, but it is a very significant primary. If I should win this primary, I will surely have additional impetus in my efforts to obtain the nomination. I believe that uh, at the best, uh, any candidate going to the Democratic Convention will not have over 500 votes. And 500 votes is uh, about 165 less than he needs. And if you have 200 votes, you're just as much alive politically as the man with 500 votes. And when it gets right down to it out of Los Angeles at the Democratic Convention, the Democratic Party is going to want a candidate who will take this battle to the Republicans, who will speak up unequivocally, who will stand on the platform, who will be able to wage a battle against Mr. Nixon, the Republican nominee, and who will not back off. I waged that battle in my opening statement tonight because I believe that the Republican administration has been costly to this country, and it has been an unhappy administration for the future of America, and I want no more of it. Senator Kennedy, do you care to comment? Well, I think that uh, Senator Humphrey has stated, and he stated it the other day in the District of Columbia, that he hoped to have at the convention uh, 200 votes. And I agree with you uh, that there probably won't be any candidate who goes in at the beginning with 500. I think this primary may well be key, however, in the state of West Virginia. I ran in the, the New Hampshire primary. I've run in the Wisconsin primary where I was successful against Senator Humphrey and Mr. Nixon. I ran in the Indiana primary yesterday. In the Pennsylvania primary, we received 175 or 80,000 write-in votes, which was a good many more, I think, which was 75% of all the write-ins. And I'm running uh, in Maryland, and we run again in Oregon. This is a key primary. I think that what happens here could very well determine what will happen at uh, Los Angeles. No one knows who's going to win, but I would say it may well be decided in West Virginia. Senator Kennedy. <coughs> I will say, if I may further, that there are other candidates. There are supporters who are supporting Senator Humphrey in the state and not supporting me. Now, they must make a judgment that if Senator Humphrey wins, it eliminates me, but Senator Humphrey does not serve as a major threat to them. Otherwise, I don't see why every candidate who is opposing me for the nomination, that their supporters in the state are supporting Senator Humphrey. Understood. Next question. Next question. Mr. Kennedy. Senator Kennedy, sir. This, Senate, this question has been sent in name withheld from Charleston. The Roman Catholic Church's position on truth versus error assumes a right to discriminate against Protestants in some countries where Catholics are in the majority. Do you agree with the Church's reported attitude that where Protestants are a minority, they shouldn't be permitted equal status? Well, I wholly disagree. I couldn't disagree more. I think that the, using the power of the state against any group, forcing, using the state to force a group to be of one faith or another or of a faith, I think is wholly repugnant to our experience. I wholly disagree with that. Now, there are some states where there is no separation between church and state. The Queen of England is the head of the Church of England as well as the state. 
There are other states in Europe where the relationship is intimate. In Spain, the relationship between church and state has been intimate. I disagree with that. This country was founded on the principle of the separation of church and state. This is the view that I hold against any other view. And it's the view that I subscribe to in the Constitution. Now, other countries have less fortunate experiences. I wish they all provided for the separation of church and state. But we do in this United States, and we're going to continue to do it, because I don't know anyone who holds any position of responsibility that isn't devoted to that and wishes that that system could spread throughout the world. Senator Humphrey? It was stated very well. This obviously is my position. I have always believed in and will continue to believe in the separation of church and state because it is fundamental, you know, to my mind, to the basic political democracy uh, that this country enjoys and that it wants to enjoy, enjoy in the years ahead. Now, in the brief time that I have left, I should like to comment on a matter which was raised by my friend from Massachusetts about the support that we have here in the state of uh, West Virginia. Now, Senator Jack, I haven't had any endorsement from Lyndon or from Stu. As a matter of fact, their neutrality has been so conspicuous that it's almost been uh, icy. Uh, I uh, must say, however, that uh, uh, I've seen uh, in other areas of the country where there was considerable support to, uh, for you. I know that in Wisconsin, for example, that a number of Republicans were very strong for you. It's quite well recognized that they were. I also know that there were those uh, that, uh, for example, a congressman came out very strongly for you, sort of ganged up on me. Congressman Zablocki, nice fellow, don't misunderstand me, but he could have been neutral. And uh, I must say that I haven't... Uh, was he a Democrat? A good Democrat, yes. yes, but isn't Johnson a Democrat? He's a majority leader, and even if I would think... I don't think Congressman Zablocki is candidate for the president, <laughs> however. <laughs> Never can tell. It's wide open. Gentlemen, Senator Humphrey has the floor Excuse me, for I'm 30 sorry. more seconds. I'm sorry. I'm through. Next question. Well, let's uh, talk about... Uh, I don't know where the... the primary in Wisconsin, you could vote in either primary. I don't know how the votes to divide. The congressman, less than, there were congressmen, Democrats supporting Senator Humphrey and some supporting me. The only point I make is that there have been the statement, including a statement by, I think, Senator Humphrey's campaign, that Senator Humphrey was his third choice. Senator Kennedy, <clears throat> we have two minutes left to the end of the program. I will give you each one minute apiece to debate on this subject. You have the floor, sir, for one minute debate on the subject when on the subject that you have just opened that you are replying on now you have one minute oh well i merely uh, say senator humphrey runs in and he's a very able vigorous <coughs> senator all i stated was that those who are supporting other candidates have uniformly supported the candidacy of senator humphrey in west virginia now that is their privilege but that is because in my opinion the other candidates believe and their supporters that if we can be stopped here in west virginia it'll be difficult to be nominated. That's why I say this is the key primary. And therefore, I'm running as hard as I can, and uh, I'm running against what I consider to be a coalition of those who choose a good many other candidates. That is their privilege. All I have is the privilege of pointing it out. Senator Humphrey, one minute, sir. Well, Senator, let me just say this, that I welcome the support of the good people of West Virginia, and I haven't given them any blood test. I happen to believe that uh, if they wish to support Senator Humphrey, that they have uh, every right to do so. I can recall here not long ago that a poll showed you ahead 70 to 30 percent and there was no complaint at all about who the support was for. And when the race tightened up a bit, well, all at once we had some complaints about who was supporting whom. I merely want to say that uh, in this primary election, I have had generous support from the rank and file of our people. In the District of Columbia yesterday, I saw Kennedy's support for Senator Morris, one of his uh, prime workers. Now, despite that, I didn't call it a gang up. I went ahead and proceeded with the election and won it. I hope to be able to do exactly the same thing here in West Virginia, but to do it honorably without retaliation. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen, both for appearing on this open face-to-face -face debate this evening from West Virginia. The preceding political debate between Senator John F. Kennedy and Senator Hubert H. Humphrey was presented by WCHS-TV, the Charleston Gazette, and the participating stations as a public service. This has been a WCHS-TV studio presentation directed by Doug Martin, technical director, William E. Dixon.